In this video, I'm going to give you a brief history of the Gibson 330R 330. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, Jamie Holroyd here helping you learn jazz guitar. Welcome to the channel. If you're new to jazz guitar and you want a structured guide on learning jazz guitar, then please check out the free beginner jazz guitar ebook linked and listed below. In this video, I'm going to give you a brief history, some sound samples, and the timeline of the Gibson 330. <laughs> The Gibson 330 is often compared to a Gibson 335, but in my opinion, this guitar really is the forerunner of the ES225. The designs of guitars such as the Gibson Birdland really influenced the ES Finline range of guitars, and the ES330 has more in common with the Birdland and a 225 than a 335, at least in my opinion, from a sound and aesthetics point of view. There are two variations of the Gibson ES330, there is an ES330 TD, which means electric Spanish thin line double cutaway. Electric Spanish, Spanish seems like a strange term, but you've got to remember back when that term was launched, you would have either had a Spanish guitar played in this way, or you'd have had a Hawaiian guitar played this way. So Spanish simply meant holding the guitar and playing it in an upright position. The two variations basically mean that there are differences with the pickups. The TD means thin line double pickup, so that's the most common 330 that you see, people like Grant Green use the 330 like that. And the other one just has one pickup and it's kind of an oddball design. You've got to remember that this was in the 1950s and there was lots of experimentation that was going on back then. So the pickup is actually kind of not so close to the neck. It's kind of in the middle of the guitar body. So that model wasn't obviously as popular and that's why it was discontinued in the early 1960s. The 330 is often compared to the Epiphone Casino. Of course, the 330 inspired the design of the Casino. The 330 came out in 1959, whereas the Casino came out in 61. And from what I can see, there's not massive differences. Obviously, the Casino has a range of famous players that have promoted the guitar. People like Keith Richards, the Beatles, all play casinos, which means they probably command a higher price tag because of the players that are associated, whereas not so many players played free free years. The only difference, or at least the main difference that I can gather is that the free free year had a three ply top, whereas the casino had a five ply top. So a little bit of a difference there. There's quite a few differences between the Gibson free free five and free free year. One of the main ones is of course the sound block. In a 335, there is a big block which helps reduce feedback. The 330 is completely hollow. Because of that, that's why they have the uh, trapeze tailpiece. A Gibson obviously has a stop tailpiece, whereas a 330 has the tailpiece that you typically see on arch tops. Of course, this was later used from the mid to late 60s on 335, but early on, the Gibson 330 had the trapeze tailpiece and that stayed on the design ever since its launch. Another difference between 335s and 330s, at least the early 330s, is that the neck joint on a 330 happened at the 16th fret, whereas on the 335 this happened at the 19th fret. In the late 60s, Gibson redesigned the 330 to actually have the same neck joint as the 335. These are sometimes referred to as long neck 330s, whereas the early ones are short neck 330s. The long neck was basically Gibson's response to Fender's designs of guitars like the Strat. You know, obviously a Strat gives you great access to the higher frets, so Gibson wanted to have some kind of competition. Price-wise, the Free Free originally launched at $330. This was a student level or budget Finline guitar by Gibson, and it was priced competitively. So if you paid $5 more, you would get a Free Free 5. If you wanted to pay $345 you get a 345 and then a 355. The difference is that allegedly Gibson used the top quality woods on the 355 and then the second best on the 345 and so on and so forth. So the 330 reflected that. If you look at the design of the headstock for example you see it's got the Cluson Butterbean tuners 
and not the kind of um, higher level tuners that you would see on a 335 or a 345. Perhaps the most famous jazz guitar player who used a 330 was Grant Green. His use of the Gibson Thin Line influenced a bunch of jazz guitar players, including Andy Summers. Ironically, a good friend of mine actually told me that Grant Green only used a 330 for around 18 months. He used one around the time he was working for Blue Note, and it must have been fairly new around that point because he was doing a lot of his work for Blue Note in the early 60s, and if we try and put a timeline together, it seems like Grant Green was using a strap before that, then moved to a free free -er, and then of course he went into all the arch tops before getting into his uh, De Equista. From looking at pictures of Grant Green's free free -er, we can see that the neck had dot inlays, so this must have been a 59, 60 or 61, perhaps maybe an early 62. Another jazz guitar player that used a free free -er is the seriously underrated English jazz guitar player Terry Smith. We can see from looking at pictures that Terry Smith used an early 60s free free as well, but if you look at the inlays on his fingerboard, then they are the block inlays, so that, and of course you do have the metal pickup covers as well, so that must be at least a 1962 free free -er, so a little bit later than the free free that Grant Green used. If you don't have it already, check out an album called Fallout by Terry Smith. That's a great example of free free -er guitar sounds. And uh, Terry Smith actually said in an interview that he used a free free -er for that, and that is pictured on the album cover. Interestingly as well, in an interview from 1974, Terry Smith said that he strung his free free -er with heavy flat wound strings, and it sounds fantastic on this album. So go and check that one out if you don't have it already. The last free free -er player that I'd like to share with you is the late, great Emily Remler. We can see from looking at pictures that she also used an early free free -er. This one is interesting though because we can see looking at the tailpiece that there's something different going on here. There seems to be one or two different names for this tailpiece. One name which I came across was called the Liar tailpiece and another was called the Maestro Vibrola. I'm not that familiar with either of those but you can see from looking at the pictures that she seemed to take the tremolo arm off and just use it without being a jazz guitar player or at least a straight ahead player there wouldn't have been much need for her to use that. You can also see that Emily Remler customised her free free -er by replacing the P90 pickups with humbuckers. This is surprisingly more common than what you think. If you look at vintage free free -ers, that seems to be a common modification because if you buy a free free -er and you replace the P90s with humbuckers, that's obviously a much cheaper way of accessing a vintage Gibson ES Finline guitar than buying a free free five, for example. Many of the changes that happened on the 335 happened on the 330. For example, in 1962, block inlays replaced the dot inlays. That's why if you have an early 330 from 1951 to 1961, they are often referred to as dot neck 335s or dot neck 330s. Another change that happened in 1962 was the introduction of metal pickup covers for the P90s. Prior to this, all the pickup covers were black, then in 1962 they changed to metal and I think it was around 1964, 1965 the parts went from chrome to nickel because apparently nickel was less hard wearing than what chrome was. In 1963 the single pickup ES330 was discontinued. The Mickey Mouse ears also changed. If you look at the early designs, the dot neck 330s and 335s, they had what's referred to as Mickey Mouse ears but they were changed to be less rounded around 1963. In 1966, the 17 degree headstock pitch changed to 14 degrees. This became standard on all models and this was apparently to combat breakages that could have happened on the headstocks of all Gibson thin lines before 1966. Around late 1967, 1968 is when some more changes started to occur. That's when Norley took over Gibson and these are sometimes controversial years amongst vintage guitar collectors. Ted McCarty left Gibson and some other changes happened to the Gibson Free Free -er. New finishes were introduced such as Walnut and the Darker Sunburst in 1969 and the neck on the Free Free -er changed from a short neck to a long neck. The neck now joined on all Free Free -ers at the 19th fret like the Free Free 5. In 1972, the Free Free was discontinued, but it has occasionally made comebacks in the Gibson Memphis lineup. Some recent popular models include the Gibson Slim Harper model and the 59 reissue. I'd like to finish off this video by including a short clip of me playing Free Free with a bit of overdrive on. These guitars do sound great with overdrive as well. Obviously, 
being that they're completely hollow, they can really feed back and growl if you put enough drive on them. So let's check out our free free sounds with some other drive on. So if you're looking at purchasing a free free today, then what can you do and what are some examples of what's in the market? Well, when you look on places like Reverb, eBay or vintage guitar shop websites, you'll see that you can get some mint condition free free but as I said in the beginning of the video, they were initially thought of and marketed as budget guitars. So you often find a lot of free free that are not in amazing conditions, which haven't been taken care of. So you can see them in really beat up conditions and sometimes with quite a few modifications. If you're looking to spend slightly less, I've also seen a model by Eastman called a T64, which seems to have a very similar design to a free free year. I've never tried one of these personally, so I couldn't really comment, but I'd be interested to know what you guys think. So let me know in the comment section below if you have ever played a T64 and let me know how it compares to a free free year. So that concludes a brief history of the Gibson free free year. What do you think about this guitar? Is it a guitar that you'd like to have, the guitar that you do have? Do you prefer it to hollow bodies? Please share your thoughts in the comment section below so we can get some ideas on what people like.